Hello and welcome to Glitchy Switch, the podcast all about what it feels like discovering you have ADHD as an adult. My name is Martin and I believe that no one deserves to live in shame in a world not designed for them. So in each episode, I'll pick off the kind of questions that go through your mind on the journey from curiosity to diagnosis. Whether you're on your own journey or supporting someone who is, I hope my own experiences might just help you. I know what it's like to have a busy life and a busy mind, so each episode lasts about as long as a cup of coffee, so you can easily fit it in and enjoy without draining too much energy. This week, we're covering a topic that, to be honest, I've been dying to talk to you about ever since we first got together. That topic is music, and I'm not even going to add a caveat We will talk about this subject multiple times, I promise you. Music is my thing in life. Just like for some people it's golf, for others it's running, for me it's music. As long as I can remember, there's always been something musical in my world. My parents love music and my dad in particular. So when I was little, we did a lot together related to music of some kind. Throughout the 1980s when I was growing up, Most Sundays, my dad and I would be crouched down by the hi-fi recording the top 40 onto cassettes, which we then play back in the week that followed. Anybody growing up around that time probably tells similar stories, by the way. I still actually have the tapes. They're one of my most treasured possessions. So lots of fond memories there. But if we weren't doing that, we were either playing records, buying records, talking about buying records or discussing hi-fi equipment to play records on. I started to buy them as soon as I had money of my own, which to start with would be birthdays and Christmas, even with book tokens. They used to let you buy records with book tokens, which was quite cool. And I still buy them today, both in digital and vinyl format, and I doubt I will ever stop. I started DJing nearly 30 years ago this year in July, and I have a radio show and still play DJ gigs regularly now. DJing is a big enough thing, though, that I think I'll cover that in a separate episode of some kind. Anyway, I wanted to talk a bit more particularly about how I think ADHD has affected my relationship with music when I now look back with the benefit of diagnosis, because I've thought about this a lot. I've always liked music that either triggers a rush of adrenaline or otherwise some kind of reward it needs to give me a return i've come to realize that as adhd people we're wired to chase dopamine and adrenaline to keep our focus and motivation and so it's hardly surprising really that music that has got some kind of i don't know visceral effect on me has ended up being my go-to for reasons i've talked about before i've lived a pretty risk-free and trouble-free existence particularly as a child because I was ultimately always worried about letting people down and causing upset. So I was never going to go searching for actual danger in real life. But I did like listening to quite edgy music, even when I was quite young. I always think of my neighbour growing up, who was a few years older than me at school and one of the coolest kids on our estate. It was him who first introduced me to underground genres like hip hop and rap music. And he could break dance, which I just thought was the best thing ever. You've got to remember, this is sort of the early to mid 1980s. I did know then, though, that this was kind of a world I would never inhabit in reality because it was all a bit too risky and a little bit too gangster and edgy and all of that kind of stuff. And that would just worry everyone around me. One way I could get that kind of charge, though, if you like, that kind of Ooh, certain free song was through the music and I used to escape off into the world of Ice T and NWA and people like that sketching out graffiti that I was far far too straight to put on a wall anywhere nearby my neighbour did obviously <laughs> but um, I can see looking back that that sort of kick was something more innate that I was craving even back then as a kid it was almost like I could do something sort of that would scare people without scaring people if that makes sense even if it was just me escaping in my head you you may remember I said about how the psychiatrist said I should thank my parents for providing such a good structure for me growing up and I always think back to the wannabe gangster in the young me when I think of that moment actually funny it's the first thing I thought of around that time house music suddenly blew up here in the UK and that changed my life forever 
You may remember yourself if you're old enough. Uh, look it up if you're not, you lucky people. Um, but stuff like Jack Your Body by Steve Silk Hurley started to appear on things like Top of the Pop. So, you know, mainstream TV, Thursday nights. Pump Up the Volume got to number one in the charts in 1987, which I remember very, very clearly. And this was another underground movement which naturally caught my attention. But it also had two things in particular which, looking back, I can see sort of naturally hooked me. For a start, it was a very technical kind of sound. A lot of those early house music records were essentially drum machine loops with samples over the top made by DJs rather than classically trained musicians. So their construction was primitive enough that you could hear the joins, so to speak. And I talked before about reverse engineering computer code as a hyper focus. So you can imagine how sort of intoxicating I found reverse engineering, the thing that had been part of my life and something that had bonded me with the people I loved the most since I was born. I mean, things like scratching just absolutely blew my mind, especially given my dad and I were really into hi-fi kit and real, real sticklers for handling our records carefully. Uh, me and a friend of mine actually got really into trying to create our own house remixes using his dad's hi-fi because it had a good pause button that didn't make a click and cassettes. And, and it sounded mostly awful, probably looking back. And we probably, I think, drove his mum mad, but it was just a brilliant feeling that you, you, you could kind of get close to creating this stuff yourself. It was just, it was just tangible enough that you could, you could feel it and touch it. And yeah, music very, very definitely was, is, and will likely always be a hyper focus for me because of that. The second thing is that it's a naturally focusing sort of genre. The reason why house music works on a dance floor is that it's grounded in, you know, repetitive beats and melodies and grooves. It's relentless and it's designed to keep people on the dance floor and in the zone, if you like. So again, though I didn't know why at the time, that solid focus of beats and bass was something that I really felt on a kind of, I don't know, again, kind of visceral level. It was like, like deep inside me. So it wasn't house music, but um, guilty pleasure. I always loved Mel and Kim's Respectable, not because of the melody or the vocal, but because of its beats and bass. And th that bass hook, I, I can literally hum for hours, and I mean literally hours, when I think of it now. In fact, it's in there now, so I'll try and focus. So I think the focusing nature of that electronic, what we call in the trade, the four on the floor style was probably a perfect recipe for me looking back. Um, as an aside, I went through a phase of being really into Jimi Hendrix when I was about 12, 13, and I still love him now. But the Hendrix track that grabbed me really in the feels, as it were, was Hey Joe, which if you listen to it, has an absolutely incredible rhythm section to it. So the bass and the drums, the best version of it, uh, where that really, really hits is his performance at the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. I've got it on CD. You probably haven't, but Google it. I'm sure you'll be able to find it on YouTube and listen to it all the way through on some decent headphones and you will see or rather hear exactly what I mean. It's just like fantastic. The final piece of my musical jigsaw I wanted to point to was my love of soulful vocals. I just love music that has a strong emotional component to it. I want to be moved and I want it to register on my feelings. And I'm the sort of person that will listen to a particularly emotive track that I know will make me cry repeatedly until I am wailing. Now, that's probably a bit odd and it may or may not be particularly an ADHD thing. I think it is. I just haven't worked out how to explain it to you yet. But... What definitely is, is the way that soul music often has, you know, kind of soaring vocals, those long drawn out notes, those choruses, those diva voices, the vibrato, those really big voices that just, oh, they just lift you off your feet. That, I think, very definitely is to do with ADHD because we're always seeking a dopamine buzz. ADHD, as we know, 
is often thought to be a deficit of dopamine and that uplifting powerful vocal that takes you from right down low to really up high i've got a terrible singing voice i'm not going to do it really does give you a pretty good hit of the happy stuff i've always loved disco music as well and it's no surprise that having come from disco house music and disco share the notion of tension and release as a common sort of construct Tension and release is where there's a kind of long musical run-up that just builds and builds and builds, so creates tension before a climactic moment of some kind, which gives you the release, as you might work out. One of the famous house music devices is the use of a drum roll that just gathers pace and volume over several tens of beats and bars before Finally, all the drums stop and you've got this really big sort of piano riff or some synth or some strings, often with, a you know, soaring diva vocals over the top. The sort of thing that everybody on dance floors throws their hands in the air and all of that kind of stuff. I have never been able to get enough of that sound and that feeling, whether in disco or house form. I absolutely love it. Inject it into my veins. I cannot get enough of it. I mentioned about my DJ and in recent times there's been increasing coverage of the higher than usual proportion of people. I tried to find the percentage for you, but I can't find it. With ADHD, who are DJs, we'll take ADHD and club culture and DJing another day, I think. And correlation and causation are different, but that was no surprise to me at all. And actually it was another sort of teensy weensy little affirmation when i got my diagnosis you know another little piece of the jigsaw that sort of fell into place now we could go on but you've probably finished your coffee by now so i'm gonna let you go next time though i think we'll try and do something about adhd traits on a day-to-day basis thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe You can get in touch via glitchyswitchpodcast at gmail.com with your thoughts and suggestions of things you'd like to hear about. You can also follow me on at glitchyswitchpodcast on Instagram for more on ADHD life and to find out what's coming next.